Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello, my name is Ray Gerard. Welcome to another edition of St. Paul's Letters to America. This is the program that raises the question, what if St. Paul were alive today, and what if he were here to write a letter specifically to America. What would he say? What would he say if he could talk to us today? Well, on this program, we think we know. In fact, we're pretty confident we know exactly what he would say. He would say the same things that he wrote to people in the Mediterranean world 2,000 years ago. Why? It's very simple. All scriptures all of the scripture, is timeless. And this is true of St. Paul's writings. They express truths that are timeless. Now, on this program, we often talk about, and we often use St. Paul's writings in regard to um, a subject area that people often say never to talk about. That nexus, uh, that area of life where politics and religion come together. And... Um, we use St. Paul's writings to hopefully illumine that area a little bit for us. And as we do, we always bear a motto in mind, which is love and kindness, but through the light of truth. And that is hopefully what we do here. Now, in today's program, we're going to be talking about something that if St. Paul were around today, he would definitely have something to say about it, something he would definitely write to us about something he would definitely try to help us with, and that is the scandals surrounding the priesthood in the Catholic Church, the sexual abuse scandal. Now, the reason we're going to be talking about it uh, now is, um, well, it's because, um, I mean, there's, we could have talked about it at, at, any, at any point in time, but something, uh, something new has happened. There has been a, a relatively a novel development that's occurred just the other day, which is that Pope Emeritus Benedict wrote a letter of his own on the priestly scandal. He, um, since his retirement, he has maintained a very quiet posture. He has kept in the background. He has remained silent. Why? Simply because he wants to respect the current Pope. He doesn't want to create any confusion among the faithful that there were two voices speaking for the church. And so he has remained uh, a modest and very quiet demeanor. Nonetheless, the gravity of the scandal is such, and its continuing effect on the church uh, is such, that um, he felt compelled to speak out. Now, at the beginning of his letter, what he says is that he wrote this, or he decided to publish this, after... He consulted with the Vatican um, and uh, and Pope Francis himself, and he said that uh, afterwards it seemed appropriate uh, to publish this letter. So we can, I think, uh, fairly well surmise that he didn't receive any opposition to his idea for publishing the letter, because if he did if either Pope Francis or the Vatican or Vatican, the other Vatican officially contacted uh, Cardinal, uh, uh, well, his name, yes, Cardinal Pietro Parolin, who is the Secretary of State for the Vatican. In any event, um, if either one of them had objected, I don't think Francis, I, mean, I don't think Benedict would be able to say that it seems, it still seemed appropriate to publish his letter. So he did uh, contact them first. And and why wouldn't they want him to publish the letter? Um, any help from any respected source uh, can um, do nothing, hopefully, but provide some good to the church. So Pope Benedict wrote his letter. 
And so now we have a letter from Benedict, and we also have, for your consideration, a letter from St. Paul. And the fact of the matter is, they both are very, um, very consistent. They both stress one concept very, very strongly. Let's begin with the letter from St. Paul. Uh, it was originally written to the Philippians. It comes out of chapter two from the uh, chapter two of that letter, and he says, "Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness." And found human in appearance, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, those of heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, St. Paul wrote other letters that we might, uh, or that uh, other people might normally consider would be relevant to the subject of the sexual abuse scandal. But I find this one very relevant. And why? Because it refers to that moment in time from which all other human history revolves. And why not even our calendar? I mean, this is the year 2019. Why do we call it the year 2019? I mean, history revolves around Christ. It is the pivotal moment in the story of the relationship between God and man. It is, after all, as St. Paul is telling us, uh, something remarkable to behold. Christ, God himself, the Word. It is said in the, in the Bible that in the beginning was the Word. And um, it is also said that uh, through Christ, that all things were made through Christ and for him. Um, at the very Christ participated, he cooperated in creation. He was there at the moment of creation. All things were created through him and for him. The word went out. At the God, it says in Genesis that God said, "Let there be light." God uttered words, and Christ is referred to as the Word. God said, and it was done. And all things were created through Christ. This we talk, Christ was there. Christ was there. He participated. He cooperated in creation. And it's all. It also says in the Bible, actually, Saint Paul says it, that all things hold together through Christ. In other words, without Christ, without Christ continuing to will, without God continuing to will, that our planet, our our the humanity, our lives, that we continue to exist without him willing that we continue to exist, we would in fact cease to exist. This God, this immense divine being, decided to make himself one of his creatures. It is a radical, a shocking, a dramatic beyond description concept. It is this God who humbled himself. This is a moment in history like no other. Of course, St. Paul emphasizes it. And what does he say to us? He says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend. Does that matter? I mean, when the priest scandal is discussed, do we talk about the incarnation? Do we talk about the sacrifice on the cross? Do we talk about the Eucharist? Do we talk about the God-man and the need to follow Jesus? We can talk about a lot of things. 
How often do we talk about that specifically? But we should. Every knee should bend. Does that matter? Yes. And how does that relate to the priest scandal? St. Benedict can tell us. So let's uh, unpack his letter a little bit, shall we? All right. Now, St. Benedict, St. Benedict, I'm giving it, um, <laughs> I'm proclaiming him a saint. Well, I guess I may be getting a little bit ahead of myself. But in any event, um, what does uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict tell us? He tells us, he starts off his letter reviewing some historical background. And he tells us that things radically changed in the 1960s, that we did have, in fact, a sexual revolution. Why does he point to that? Why does he point to that? It's interesting, is it not? There was a study done by the John Jay College of the City University of New York. Um, they compiled data for a year and then issued a report in, two, in the year 2004 at the request of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops to try to look into the reasons behind the priest scandal to find out how extensive it was and perhaps to try to explain it. It was um, a very detailed, comprehensive, uh, hopefully constructive study. That was the that was the design. That was the hope. And what um, what did they find? Among other things, they found that the incidence of sexual abuse by priests grew at a rather uh, steady rate in the 1960s and 70s, peaking in the year 1980, and then steadily, rather steeply declining after that. There was a very uh, dramatic um, hike in the curve in terms of um, the number of incidents. Why? Well, a lot of people draw the correlation. Well, we had uh, the sexual revolutions in the 60s. And why should the priesthood be immune from the culture around him? Why should uh, the priests, they're human after all, uh, be totally uh, divorced from what's going on around them? Would, it not, would we not perhaps expect to find uh, that as sexual activity uh, in, the, uh, in the population as a whole changed and increased in some regards, that uh, that would also affect the priesthood. And, in fact, that's what the John Jay study found. So it's no surprise, then, that St. Uh, <laughs> there I go again. It's no surprise that uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict uh, looks back to the 60s. Uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict is now 91 years old, I believe, and um, looking over a life that spans almost a whole century, Unlike many of the rest of us, he can see the differences that have occurred over the nine decades of his life. He can see very clearly what things were like back in the 1930s and 40s and how they're different in the 60s and 70s and now today. So he points to this and he says that everything that had previously not been allowed to be shown publicly all of a sudden was now shown if he calls an incident where he was walking through the streets uh, of the city of Regensburg one day and crowds where people were lining up in front of a cinema, something that uh, we had previously only seen in times of war. Why? Why were they lining up? Uh, there, was, uh, there was a film that was showing something sexually explicit right there on the streets. Um, he recalls um, Good Friday in the year 1970, when he saw billboards all over the city plastered with a large poster of two completely naked people in a close embrace. These things were unheard of years before. Things changed dramatically. Um, he talks about the fact that pedophilia, he says, pedophilia was then also diagnosed as allowed and appropriate. That is an incredible statement. Pedophilia was then, in, in the context of what he calls the Revolution of 68, in and around that time, he says, pedophilia was then also diagnosed and allowed as appropriate. I, I, <laughs> who would actually 
say such a thing? You know, in what in what place in, in what group would 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 that be true? Everybody might might think on the surface that's just a ridiculous statement. Uh, pedophilia is never allowed, or is it? What's he talking about? I believe he's talking about the relativism that has come into play. Pedophilia is now seen as an illness, a psychological sickness. Um, it is uh, not something that is somebody's fault uh, in a moral context, in the context of someone exercising their own free will. It's almost as if they're too sick to help themselves. We have, and this is this is a facet of our modern culture, we have the famous Twinkie defense that somebody used in a criminal trial because someone received too much sugar. So it affected you know, how they acted to the point where they're not responsible for how they acted. Now, alcoholism has been used as a defense and someone was not aware you know, of his actions and so forth. But uh, Twinkies, why not? So the same with pedophilia, it would seem. And uh, this, this is what uh, he's objecting to. He says that he is. He's always wondered. He's, he have, he has always wondered how young people in this situation, the during the times of the sexual revolution, how people in this situation could approach the priesthood and accept it with all its ramifications. The extensive collapse of the next generation of priests in those years, and the very high number of lay laicizations were a consequence of all these developments. It seems it seemed odd to him. It seemed difficult. It seemed to him that it was going to be much more difficult for somebody to enter a seminary in the 1960s and 70s as it was perhaps in his day and age. The priesthood and all its ramifications obviously means celibacy. And how do you is it not so much harder for a person to abstain completely from all kinds of sexual activity when the world around you is filled with messages and attention and focus on sexual activity? One way to try to uh, maintain a celibate priestly lifestyle, obviously, is not to think about sexual activities, to control any uh, thoughts uh, that would tempt you otherwise. Well, if the world around you is full of temptation, isn't it going to be that much harder to resist? Now, this seems like a simple concept, but how much do we ever really consider it? Well, Pope Emeritus Benedict is telling us, consider it. The world has radically changed. We're sitting around scratching our heads. Why do we have this tremendous priest scandal when, in fact, if we simply look at the common sense changes, if we simply look with common sense at the changes in our world, some of the answers might not be all that hard to grasp. If, for example, I, you know, it's interesting, but I, I happen to pull out an old Baltimore catechism. This particular one was published in 1964. And, um, there's a discussion in it uh, on venial sin. It's a book that um, this particular version was intended, I think, for kids in perhaps second and third grade. Um, so obviously, you know, simple examples meant for young children. And this one, uh, in talking about venial sin, says, well, suppose a boy says no to his mother without thinking when she asks him to help with the dishes in the middle of his favorite TV show. But afterwards, he thinks of how our Lord said yes to his father, even when his father asked him to die on the cross. I mean, <laughs> who would write that in a book for children today? I mean, seriously, would you find that in a book today? Or would we think, oh, that, that's, just too, that's just too ridiculous. I mean, you want a kid in front of a TV screen to be thinking about Jesus dying on the cross? I mean, come on, I mean, what are we going to be thinking about Jesus dying on the cross every minute of the day? We're going to compare that to saying no to helping your mother do the dishes? No, we wouldn't think like that today. But that was normal. That was considered normal enough to make it into the catechism. And so 
religious uh, education teachers all around the country would teach that. The world has changed radically. And what does this passage suggest? This passage suggests the same thing that we see in the letter from St. Paul. And as we'll continue to see, the same thing is in the letter from Pope Emeritus Benedict. Christ needs to be at the center of how we look at life. We lose him as the center of our focus on life and all the questions, all the questions we have to deal with in this life. And we lose our grip on the center of the meaning of our lives. We lose the grip on reality. We lose the grip on truth. I mean, if if all is true that we believe that Christ was God, that he came and he took the form of a human, and he died. And why shouldn't we think all of those things? Because he was seen after death. How many people do you know were seen after death? I mean, these these, this, these concepts are so well known that we tend to we tend to forget them. We tend to you know put them on the side. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard that. I've heard that. I've heard that. Um, <laughs> no, it's so radical, but it's true. And when the radical is true, that um, needs to be accounted for. We can't just simply ignore it. And they didn't do that in this Baltimore Catechism from 1964. They were telling this to kids then. And are we telling it to our priests today? And is that the reason, perhaps, for the scandal? This sounds simplistic. But a lot of times, simplicity walks hand in hand with the truth. Well, let's continue with Pope Benedict's letter. What else does he tell us? Well, oh, before we do that, um, just to, to illustrate this point a little further, this point that we were just talking about, consider a hypothetical. How about a priest approaching, uh, perhaps let's say, an altar boy, for example, in the 1950s or 1940s with um, some idea on his mind of committing some type of sexually inappropriate act? Would it not affect the priest or make the priest think perhaps twice if he thought that the boy had no awareness of um, sexual things, that he was perhaps, as you might say, innocent, that he was still enjoying the age of innocence, would he somehow be affected by a fear of shocking the boy, that if he shocked the boy, the boy might... um, uh, you know, react uh, too strongly, that uh, he might shout, he might yell, uh, who knows? Now, of course, those kinds of fears will affect anybody, even today, who's going to do this kind of an act. But nevertheless, it, it would seem that perhaps a priest um, might think differently, might think differently, uh, in terms of approaching a boy who he regards as sexually innocent, simply because um, you know, you're introducing, it's always harder to introduce something when there's no context for it, when, there's, when, when you're doing something completely new, when it's coming out of left field. Uh, but if, there's, uh, if, if all the world around you, all the culture around you, all the TV around you, uh, all the books, the media around you, um, deal with sex only gingerly and not very much, and you then try to introduce sex in any kind of a social situation, it's going to seem like you're pushing something um, further than you would, um, you know, if all these, if there's a lot of sexual content all around you. Then it's not completely you. You're not the one introducing it from nothing. Now, you know, this is not to say that sexual abuse did not occur in the 40s and 50s. It did. But what we're simply talking about is, as the John Jay study found, there was a there was a there was a dramatic increase in the 60s and 70s, and a dramatic decrease after 1980. Why? It was in the it was in the shadow. It was it was it was within. It was, it was within proximity to the sexual revolution. So 
in any event, um, Pope Benedict is drawing our attention to the fact that there was a dramatic change during this year, during these years. And then he says, this was exacerbated uh, by the fact that at the same time, the theology of the church was undergoing some rigors. The position on morality in the church for years had been guided to a large extent by natural law. And uh, natural law is simply the application of reason to um, situations between humans that we encounter in the world. But he says, Pope Benedict says that at this particular time, there arose an effort, he recalls, uh, an effort that was arisen to uh, come up with a new kind of moral theology, one that was based entirely on the Bible. In Germany, there was a particular uh, gifted, intelligent priest that was tasked with this idea of coming up with a morality based on the Bible. And he tried very hard, um, but at the end of his efforts, uh, it was determined that he could not come up with a, a, a systematic morality based exclusively on the Bible. But going back to a natural explanation didn't seem to be acceptable uh, to everyone else either. So what then resulted from this was a sort of subjective morality in theological circles, uh, which um, was based on uh, the purposes of human action. Uh, remember, before we were talking about, and uh, you know, a little example from the Catechism about uh, a morality that was tied to Christ, morality tied to God, a very objective morality. There are very clear lines of black and white in that earlier morality. Uh, now, um, those black and white lines are, are too simple. And so we need to consider different things, different circumstances. We're, we're smarter now. We have more advances of science. We understand psychological illnesses better. And so if a priest commits a wrong act, it's not just uh, ridiculed uh, and he's not uh, ostracized as, as doing something that's just plain wrong. Uh, but that now, well, it depends. Was he abused as a child? Uh, what were the environmental factors in which he grew up? Um, uh, you know, does he have some kind of, you know, psychological propensity? Does he have some kind of psychological weaknesses one way or another? We will try to explain things and uh, inevitably less blame will attach uh, to the perpetrator. And so we try to be more understanding and we try to be more knowledgeable about these sorts of things. But what is lost, obviously, is this, these clear black and white lines that attach blame to people. And um, so this is uh, this is what uh, we end up with. The um, um, So the morality underwent a change. The magisterium of the church underwent a certain attack. The idea that the church had the right to proclaim and declare what morality is and is not came under attack as well. Uh, people argued in theological circles that the morality of the church needed to match uh, morality, uh, the morality in other religions. That if other religions felt certain things, were, the more agreement there was uh, in human circles among different religions about what was moral and what was not moral, uh, the more reliable uh, those judgments were. And the idea that the church itself could say, no, we are different than everybody else. We have some special ability to see what is morally right and morally wrong. When the church takes stands like it did in the 1960s against contraception, while all the world was reveling in the you know discovery of the pill. When the church still, when it says abortion is wrong, when a lot of other people are saying, well, you know, no, actually abortion is not such a bad thing. When the church still says divorce is wrong and still uh, does annulments, the church is seen as, um, uh, you know, living still in the Middle Ages. And so this idea that the church has the right to declare what is morally right and morally wrong is attacked. And yet, and yet, there is something unique about the Catholic Church. There is something very unique about it. What is that? 
It's what we talked about. It's what St. Paul talked about. It's what we talked about when we read the letter from St. Paul. Christ. Christ became human. Do we need to know what's moral? How about you look to the Beatitudes? How about we listen to what Christ said? How about we look at how Christ lived? If God became man, what other example, what other source of information do we need than Christ? That makes the church different. That makes it unique. There is room, there is Unless we are going to deny that Christ rose from the dead and that he was seen by 500 people, that he was seen at separate times by Paul and by Peter and by James and by the apostles, unless we're going to deny that, then we have to make room for the fact that our judgments on morality need to bend. Our knees should bend at the name of Jesus. Now, Pope Benedict has been um, has been criticized. These ideas that Pope Benedict talks about, well, in our day and age, they're really pretty simple. Um, one person in particular wrote uh, a response to Pope Benedict's uh, letter, and I am going to mention his name. Um, normally, I don't care to do this. Um, I don't like to identify people. I'd rather talk about ideas and not people. Um, uh, you know, I don't want to, you know, attack people um, or criticize anybody in, a, in an individual context. But um, the uh, gentleman involved here obviously mentioned Pope Benedict's name. And since I'm going to talk about him a great deal, it would seem kind of silly if I keep referring to him as some anonymous priest. Um and in fact, he's well known. He's not shy about making his opinions known. He's the editor of American Magazine. He's a Jesuit by the name of Father James Martin. And as I said, he's he's well known. He's got, I think, hundreds of thousands of followers on Twitter, uh, makes a lot of public uh, statements. And he did as well uh, with regard to Pope Benedict's letter. And he said it misses the mark. He said it was too simplistic. He said to... Put this down to, 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 to attribute the sex scandal uh, in the priesthood simply to a matter of morality, of, of a weak morality, is too simple. The fact is, uh, we need to look at the, uh, you know, the, uh, the the priesthood. We need to look at the population of the priesthood. We need to look at where these people come from, uh, what their backgrounds are. We need to give them psychological help to psychological screening. There are psychological illnesses that account for and uh, explain why these incidents of abuse happen. And just simply to talk about morality without talking about um, these psychological illnesses simply misses the mark. It's too simple. Um, it's too old-fashioned. He also thought that the idea of uh, theological underpinnings for understanding the crisis um, also was uh, was disappointing, simply because he said, well, look, uh, one of the worst offenders that he knows of, a guy who committed uh, a priest, who, um, I don't I don't know the story of this particular priest, but according to Father Martin, this particular priest was a serial abuser and a rapist. And apparently he was a proponent of very orthodox conservative theology, as Pope Benedict is. And so therefore, if he had a theology and ideas, theological ideas similar to Benedict's, then to say that you know the problem is due to a bad ideology, uh, you know, bad theology doesn't make sense. Well, obviously on the, str on the strength of one example, assuming that what Father Martin says about this one particular priest is true, and I would certainly think that it, you know, that it that it is likely to be true. Uh, assuming that, uh, we still obviously cannot make a conclusion or any kind of a generalization based on only one example. But besides that, and, and, and Father Martin was just writing, and this, this response came in some Facebook post, Facebook posting, so he didn't have a lot of space and time. And presumably, if Father Martin had more time, he could uh, give more examples or more uh, 
more of a you know more of a basis for you know what he said. But even assuming this is this is true, the fact of the matter is that a theology is still very important. We cannot disregard a theology. Theology helps us, it gives us a reason for understanding the world. Without having a game plan, without having a roadmap, how can we guide our actions? The subject of a correct theology, even if there are people that transgress, uh, violate you know, their own beliefs, and Lord knows Christianity is populated with people who say they believe in one thing and then do another, that still doesn't in any way undercut the need for an understanding of life and a good theology. So what is Father? Uh, what is the view of, of Father Martin? He criticizes. Uh, he criticizes Pope Emeritus Benedict. What's the um, What's the opinion of Father Martin as to why the sex scandal has occurred? Well, in December of 2017, he wrote an article in American Magazine, and he said, based on that same John Jay study uh, that I referred to earlier, that the reasons for abuse, according to that study and in, in his interpretation, the reasons for the the abuse by priests is, number one, an improper screening of priest candidates. We didn't keep people out of the priesthood that uh, could have been identified as having some proclivity for mental illness or sexual abuse. Um, and then, two, there was poor training of the priests. Um, now, as for the reasons for the cover-up by the bishops, you say, well, uh, the bishops did not understand the breath of the problem. They dealt with individual cases on a sporadic basis, and if they understood that this was a church-wide problem, they would have taken it more seriously. That strikes me as irrelevant. One case, one example is enough. How do you excuse a priest, a bishop, covering something up? Simply because he doesn't think it's a, it's a large problem with a lot of priests. That should not matter. Um, number two, um, bishops put the institute, the, the, the interests of the institution, the institution of the church, uh, ahead of the interests of their victims. Uh, they were affected by threats of litigation. They failed to understand the suffering of victims. They relied on lawyers and psychologists too much. They wanted to avoid confrontations with priests. They had sympathy for priests who they considered colleagues and, uh, and like souls of a, of a sort, because that uh, use that descriptive phrase very guardedly. And uh, that canon law created obstacles to trying to remove priests from their priestly duties. Um, now, Father Martin added a few causes of his own to this list. He talked about the uh, discomfort that priests and the bishops have with the subject in general of sexual abuse. Obviously, it's not a comfortable subject to deal with. He talked about bishops having a fear of change, he talked about uh, the denial of their own sinfulness and a suspicion of the media. Now, what what can we note from this list? Well, in large measure, the focus is markedly different from that of Pope Benedict. Pope Benedict talks about Christ. He talks about a morality that comes from Christ. He talks about uh, having having Christ uh, in the center of our lives, that our morality um, flows directly from this God who became man, that we cannot make subjective decisions on our own, that there are things that are true. There are certain things that are always good and always evil. There are many, of, uh, there are many moral questions that have to be decided in the circumstances where certain things do depend, and the answer may be one way or another. But then there are some, there are some cases where there is uh, absolute good and absolute evil. There are some cases where something can never be good. I can think of one example, which is denying the existence of God. And a lot of these things that we were talking about come from a society that puts uh, a much lower value on God, that doesn't count on the existence of God in deciding any of these questions. Um so there's this this concept that things are tied to Christ, whereas um, this list of reasons given by Father Martin doesn't look up. 
It doesn't look to heaven. It looks around. It looks around to hear around us, to the people around us. It looks to lawyers, psychologists, the fear of litigation, the fear of the media, uh, sympathy for the priests. Uh, we're worried about the institution. We're worried about the institution of the church. We're not worried about the body of the church, the people of the church. We're worried about the institution of the church. Bishops uh, do not understand how widespread the problem is. If something is morally right and morally wrong, and that's what's really important, then how widespread it is doesn't doesn't define how you're going to respond in your particular situation. The list that Father Martin uses is one that's tied to a lot of um, well, it's a worldly perspective. It's tied to a lot of worldly concerns. Um, Pope Benedict, as I say, um, is interested in, in something very different. He talks about um, he talks about the fact that because we're losing this sense of the omnipresence of God, because our world is becoming increasingly more secular. We said before that. You know, because the world uh, is becoming increasingly, or in the 60s and 70s, went through a sexual revolution. By the way, revolution. Revolution against what? Obviously, it was a desire to overturn what? It was a desire to overturn a lot of the old morals, a lot of the old morals in terms of dealing with sex, uh, you know, very discreetly. So there was a revolution. Just as priests were affected, affected by uh, the revolution in that regard and the culture around them, why wouldn't they be affected uh, by other things in the culture? And uh, Pope Benedict talks about the fact that uh, in seminaries, for example, uh, priests um, engage in a lot of activities with lay people. Uh, the, the priests that were studying in seminaries went through activities were lit with lay people who were studying for some type of lay ministry roles, that they would have uh, meals and activities where the wives and the children would be together. And while all that's well and good, it's, it, it can, in fact, um, increase um, some belief in the priests, that the priestly candidates, that they don't have special duties, special responsibilities to go along with their special roles. If they think of themselves as just like everybody else, well, maybe that contributes to the problem. Pope Benedict um, talked about uh, something else that was disturbing, which is that um, that uh, something showed up in the seminaries with regard to uh, ideas and the discussion of ideas, something that we're seeing on college campuses today. He said that in not a few seminaries, Students caught reading my books were considered unsuitable for the priesthood. My books were hidden away like bad literature and only read under the desk. Now, if Pope Benedict has written books that express some conservative ideas, why would those have to be hidden under a desk? Why would those be ridiculed? Why would those uh, be regarded in any kind of bad light? If you're in a seminary, it's like any other college environment, why shouldn't there not be a free exchange of ideas? If people have new ideas for the church, if we have an idea for morality that is not tied to the way the church used to uh, decide moral questions, um, and, and if the new way is better, and if the people espousing the new way feel confident that they have the truth, why should they be threatened? by these old ideas? Why should they put pressure on people to make them feel defensive about even thinking about these other ideas? This is something we see on college campuses today. There's a lack of free speech. There are attacks on free speech. And what are those attacks? These speech codes, attacks on, on free speech, are efforts not so much to just simply curb and control speech, but what they're really aimed at is the control of thought. Speech only expresses what we're thinking. You try to control the words. By reverse engineering, you're trying to control the thought, uh, the thought that goes on with people. And what is that? That is an attack 
on our free will, our God-given free will. It is the reason for our being. The church has maintained, still maintains, that that's the reason why God created us, so that we could return love to God. And giving love to God, if you're made to do it, doesn't really offer any kind of a gift to God at all. It's only by um, the ability to have free will that it means anything. So when we try to control thought, how is that at all consistent with uh, with the belief in those things that Christianity holds dear? Pope Benedict um, also notes there was a rise in ideas of due process, that the church borrowed from the culture at large the ideas of protecting the rights of the individuals. So the rights of the accused priests had to be protected. Now, while our court system, our court system is replete with instances where uh, the rights of uh, defendants are protected, and in the minds of many, uh, overly so. For example, if um, a policeman finds a gun in the possession of a particular person, let's say they find it in the back seat of a person's car, the ballistics from that gun show that it was the weapon that killed a certain person. But the police did not have proper cause to search the vehicle. You cannot use that evidence against the defendant. Now, if the defendant is guilty of shooting this, let's say we got, let's say we got the defendant's fingerprints on this particular gun, um, and as I say, this gun was used to kill a certain person. There's no other fingerprints on it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, you've got powder burns on the the the, the, the guy's hands, um, whatever. But you can't use the gun as evidence. How is that fair? How is that just? If the poli- if a policeman committed an improper search, why wouldn't the appropriate response be to impose some penalty on the cop for that action, something that's commensurate with that action, rather than allowing two wrongs to make a right. You've got somebody kills a person, you've got a cop commits an an improper search. So what do we do? We declare no harm, no foul. There's lots of harm, lots of fouls. But in any event, it's this kind of thinking that also entered the church. Another instance where the culture affecting the church. The world leading the church, as opposed to the church leading the world. In any event, this heightened sense of protecting the accused uh, in the minds of Pope Benedict does not strike the proper balance. Because what's on the other side of the scale to be balanced? Well, to be sure, we have the rights of the victim of the sexual abuse. But the... That's really something to be taken up by the criminal court system. What is the responsibility of the church in the context of priestly sexual abuse? The context is to do what's right for the church, is it not? Um, And what the church should be balancing is the harm that the sexual abuse not only does to the victim, obviously there has to be concern and sympathy for that, but the harm that's also done to the body of Christ, the harm that's done to the faith, the harm that's done to the church, the harm that's done to the church created by Christ, the church, the hierarchy of the church, the administration of the church, that's that's their particular responsibility. And when you tip the scales so far over that you're worried about the priest, where in the calculation Does the health of the church come into play? Shouldn't the proper balance be simply one that says, well, okay, we understand um, you have rights as as someone who is a defendant, but nonetheless, we have something that is extremely important to protect. And therefore, um, you know, we're going to, um, you know, going to act accordingly. Pope Francis, um, excuse me, uh, Pope Benedict says that today, if you were to suggest something like that, that that would fall on deaf ears. That we don't have um, enough of a focus on the church. And why? 
and why? Um, and, and, and Pope Benedict's idea of protecting the church is very different than what we you know, heard earlier in that list from Father Martin. Father Martin said, well, you've you got to protect the institution of the church. Or at least he said that's what the John Jay report found, that there was a desire to protect the institution of the church. Well, okay, those are the church coffers, you know, the church is an institution, that's fine. But the church in reality is the health of faith in the souls of the faithful. It is its relationship with God that is at stake. If we're worried about protecting the earthly church, we're not protecting the relationship of people with God. Certainly, if we're worried about that, then the victim who was harmed by sexual abuse is going gonna, is gonna to count so much more heavily. What about the effect on the victim's relationship with God? Um, Pope Benedict apparently met uh, with a victim personally or heard from a victim personally who talked about the fact um, that just before a particular abuser was to uh, commit uh, his acts of abuse, he would tell this young girl that was involved, um, he would say, and this is hard to believe, but he would say to her, this is my body, which is being given up for you. He blasphemed, taking the words from the mass to preface an act of depravity. And what does Pope Benedict, um, what does he think of uh, when he hears of that story, he said, how can that woman, or that girl, perhaps not a woman, um, ever go to Mass with any kind of peace of mind? How can she ever go to Mass and hear those words without thinking of these terrible acts that were committed upon her? How terribly damaged has her relationship with God become? This, this will affect us. This will affect us if we do not keep our focus on our relationship with God, on Christ, um, on his church. Uh, Benedict says that priests today prefer not to talk about God. And the criticism we have from Father Martin, there's a lot of talk about administrative uh, policies, administrative failures, uh, and supposedly the answer would be, better administrative policies and programs, better screening, better better training, um, and those types of things. We need to have, uh, you know, maybe uh, psychological examination, so on and so forth. But how can policies and programs be successful? How can they be implemented if the people implementing them don't have a heart that that will guide that implementation? If they don't seriously feel the need, and the need to be felt here is is one where if we're thinking about God, that need is going to be intense. Benedict thinks that the only way these kinds of actions can happen is if we lose our sight on God. If we maintain it, there is going to be a passion. There is going to be uh, an intensity that will guide us and will keep uh, keep programs from being implemented only with lip service. There's probably plenty of cases of that in the priest scandal. We have a world that is becoming increasingly secular. It's in fact, the sexual evolution affected the church. Um, has, you know, uh, case law, uh, cases in the courts dealing with due process, has affected the church. Um, the secularism in our world is affecting the church. The church will still maintain, yes, there's God and so forth, but how much does its focus remain on that? I heard a story recently where somebody observed, somebody's talking to a priest and observed that, um, you know, homilies these days, a lot of homilies um, doesn't talk, you know, don't, don't concern themselves with hell. We don't hear talk about hell anymore. There's no more fire and brimstone. He said, but the funny thing is, we don't get a lot of talk about heaven either. 
Fenwick tells us priests don't like to talk about God. They like to talk more about worldly things. These policies and programs, and these uh, you know, these uh, causes for the priestly scandal uh, that deal with you know fear of the media, fear of litigation. Those things make sense, and they have a part in this, but they're subsumed under a much larger umbrella, a much larger cause, which is God, the connection of God with this world. That is what's unique about the Christian faith. We believe in a very direct connection between God and in this in this world, and our connection with it. Our emphasis on our morality is shaped by that. We This world is to prepare us for the next. How are we going to get there? We have to become closer to God. We have to eventually unite ourselves with God if we're going to share in the joy of heaven. We have to practice that here on earth. We have to practice his morality and objective morality, and morality decided by God. It's all connected. It all fits together. If we lose sight of that, lose sight of who we are, we can't. We cannot effectively deal with the priest scandal in any meaningful way. This has to be, the answer to be found here has to be one where we turn our focus back to God. That's what Pope Benedict is telling us. That's what I hear. That's what we hear. That's what we can all hear in the letter from, and all the letters from uh from St. Paul. And why not? He is the truth. He is all that matters. Christ is all that matters. We hope that this particular discussion has proved interesting in some degree. Um, We need a passion, a passion for God that's going to help us get through this scandal. If not, we'll never do it. So we hope that's been interesting. We hope you enjoy it. Uh, we hope you join us again. In the meantime, we thank you for listening. God bless you all. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.